What is an 0311 Rifleman? Well, today we're going to find out. We got Corporal Strait and Corporal Koenig here who were kind enough to uh, spare some time to sit down with me and talk about what it is that it means to be a 0311 Marine Rifleman in today's infantry, which 0311 is like probably the most commonly known MOS in the Marine Corps, I would say. That's why he's the GOAT! The GOAT! <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I think that this would be great a great way for people to understand what it is that 0311 does, what a day-to-day -day living experience is for an 0311, and, and uh, like what kind of things that you guys do and just what the culture is like. So uh, we'll start with you, Corporal Strait, since you, you're uh, right here. What, when did you join the Marine Corps? Uh, so I joined in July of 2019. July of 2019. So you've been uh, you've been in for almost a little bit over, well, almost four years or four years? Just about four and a half. Four and a half years though? Okay. So you went through ITB in 2019 as well too. So I actually was an engineer when I joined over here. Oh, okay, okay. Gotcha, so gotcha. I went to MCT in 2019, Okay. came to the fleet, and then came to 1-8 as an engineer attachment. Last year I lab moved, had to go oh. back to SOI. And now I'm back here as 11. Interesting. So you started off as a combat engineer and then you lat moved to 11. Correct. Okay. And uh, Corporal Coney, when did you when did you join? I joined in October of 21. 21? Um, joined and went right to IMC over at uh, Camp Geiger. Okay. And uh, so IMC is 13 weeks, right? Yes, instead correct. Of, instead of eight. Correct. Yeah, a little bit different. Did you have a, the 13-week course too? So you both have done the 13 week course. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Um it's a lot different from probably what I what I experienced. Yeah, it is it is extremely different. Um the fact that it's just longer, they they push a lot more knowledge. Now, um I really enjoyed it actually. A lot of people, a lot of younger Marines come out and say uh, they just data dumped a lot of things, but if you take it serious, one hundred percent it's a great course. Um there's a lot of good instructors over there and they teach everything you need to know to hit the fleet. So take it serious, take your learning serious, and you'll, you'll be good to go. Yeah. They, I've heard they do a lot more marksmanship training. Yeah. So they um they have this new they have this new program they started about two years ago called AMTP. It's the Advanced Marksmanship Training Program. Um, and they right. really take the fundamentals of competition shooting, which they call hit factor scoring, yeah. and they bring that to uh, the Big Marine Corps. And it, it, what it really does is, is put a standard – behind your training yeah so they put time standards and it in my opinion you get more value out of every round you shoot that's good because i think that you know being in the infantry you're you are the trigger pullers you are literally the tip of the spear for the marine corps right so it's like why wouldn't we invest more time and invest more effort into training marksmanship on an individual level with those guys you know, it makes sense. Absolutely. So, like, the core fundamentals is, like, our, our final job is to pull triggers, but really the aspect of O311, we are a jack of all trades. We are expected to know everybody's job Yeah. at any given moment. Yeah, because you probably have to understand how mortars work. You have to understand how machine guns work. You have to understand what kind of anti-armor assets you have in case that's, a you know, part of whatever mission you happen to be, you know, going out to accomplish. Like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and... You know, what's funny is like there was a time where a uh, weapons company would actually have O311s attached to CAT to ride around as their dismounts. So Corporal Strait might be able to talk about that a little more from when he was a uh, combat engineer over in Afghan Kabul. Yeah, let's hear it. Um, So we did get to work a lot with CAT, okay. especially because back then, before the concept of MOZ was incorporated, yeah. uh, we were the anti-armor assets back when the assault men were being phased out. Uh, I was fortunate enough to actually get to train underneath the last assault men before they, you know, went their separate ways. Yeah. But uh, losing that capability, especially with CAT, obviously they've regained it in a lot of aspects now that they have a few 11s of their own yeah. or MAWs. Um, it was a good experience. And to be able to come back here and to bring that back into the line companies, I think has been a great opportunity. Yeah, especially to bring back that assault men training that had unfortunately gone away. Yeah, no, I mean, I had a lot of friends and seniors who were assault men because they were just starting to phase them out when I got to the fleet 
in 2014 and they were uh you know it was like a dying breed you know and they they were trying to offer them the opportunity to lat move to 0311 without any type of negative impact on their ability to promote and things like that and eventually i think that um uh, general neller set something up where you could do that through your like immediate chain of command like your first sergeant and your co could help you lat move and just like hey i want to stay in the marine corps but i can't promote as a 0351 well we can just basically sign some paperwork that says now you're designated as an 0311 mm -hmm. you know which is cool because we were able to retain some of these guys but mm -hmm. um as far as like demolition and stuff you've done some demolition i imagine like yeah. like what kind of demolition have you done like oh uh, i've done a lot of manufactured uh majority of what i specialized in was expedient okay uh, expedient bangalores uh omni charges frankenstein stuff like that uh just c4 barbed wire put it in an ammo can type stuff yeah how about apobs uh i've never been the gunner to an apobs i've always been a gunner okay uh, because especially in those apobs teams you want the junior as your gunner just you know yeah give like me the experience yeah yeah that makes sense so unfortunately i never got the chance uh when I hit the fleet, it was just before COVID, um, and that oh, really okay. messed a lot of my training. Uh, yeah, that's man. That was a frustrating time for everybody. I was lucky. I was in school at the time, like in college school, like because I had left the fleet to go finish my degree before I came back, right? And I missed out on a lot of the nonsense that everyone else had to deal with. Like if you were deployed, or you were on ship, or you were on Okinawa, like you got basically put in prison. From what I heard, no. because it was just like nobody knew what was going on. Everyone was freaking out and like concerned that it was going to be like, you know, people were going to start dying from this thing. So it was just like a really tough time to be in the in the military. Mm. So I can imagine that being a little, it would be a little bit of a hindrance to certain things that you're trying to do. Mm. We uh, we had actually found out when we were in the field when COVID first hit. Really? And our CO decided to keep us there longer as the perfect quarantine in his words. <laughs> perfect uh, quarantine. Perfect. Nobody quarantine. leaves. No You're all staying leave. here forever. We uh, stayed out for an extra two days, ran out of food and water because there was no resupply oh, options. No. Uh, and then 07 that morning, Motor T was there to pick us up. We trained for like a you know, week, week or two. Yeah. Weren't allowed to go in any buildings and then we didn't go to work for two months. Two months? Two months. Jeez. We would do a book report a week, some MCIs, and that was really about all you did that's weird yeah that's so weird yeah i don't know what it's like i wasn't in the fleet during that time thankfully i was able to come in right as right on the back end where you didn't have to wear masks anymore anywhere you know and and didn't have to do any of this like strange cumbersome stuff that you would not otherwise do but uh so either way you came from the engineers you went into you lat moved to become an 0311 you participated in the evacuation of Hamid Karzai International Airport with what with 18 right Correct. you were attached to 18 um see I didn't really know anybody in 18 at the time for that but I had friends in 21 mm -hmm. that were over there in cat and um uh a friend of mine was in Fox Company and a, and a few other people I, I knew a guy that was a constrat officer over there as well but um probably the battalion probably looks significantly different I imagine from from then and now because there's so many new faces and mm -hmm. some of the faces that were familiar probably left i imagine um what what is life for you like now as an 0311 instead of being a combat engineer an engineer like what's life like D like day-to-day -day life for starters i love it okay i i enjoyed my time as an engineer sure. but it did not have the the MOS pride that 11s and infantry as a whole have. There was no unit uh, camaraderie. It just didn't exist. It's about like esprit de corps. Yeah. Yeah. It did not exist. Like you were, uh, say you'd put an engineer E on something, you would, you know, get told, take that shit off now. Yeah. Stuff like that. Like you just were not allowed to take pride anywhere there. And that's why I love coming back here as an 11 finally actually getting to fully experience that yeah instead of just watching it from the sideline yeah well i think that that's that's one of the cool things about 18 specifically 18 and also the infantry but it's you know being able to have pride in what you do as a war fighting profession that's huge because that's what keeps people around you know like who who wants to stay in a place where they're not they're not feeling like hey i can be proud of what i do every day and like all my brothers and sisters here 
can all feel proud for what they do. Mm. Like that that environment, that climate, that's huge. Yeah. You know? That's cool, man. That's cool. I'm glad to I'm glad to hear that that's like the response that you've been getting from all this stuff. Mm. So you feel like you got welcomed into the fold pretty good then. Um I still when I did come back here after my lap move, I still had a few friends yeah. from the Mew. Uh they kinda helped me, you know, pull some strings to get me back in Bravo. That's cool. Um and you know, they've trickled out and now there's uh like three or four of us left. Yeah. Either extended or re enlisted to stay. Try to stay as long as you can. Yeah. Yeah. But that was part of the reason why I wanted to stay. I didn't want to leave the boys. Yeah. I get that. I know a lot of guys that feel the same way. I, it was it was tough for me specifically. I had a lot of my buddies most of my peers got out of the Marine Corps. Like most of them have been out for years. Like they got out in twenty eighteen, twenty nineteen, you know. Um, there are some of us that are still around. I have a few friends that I joined the Marine Corps with that are here on Camp Lejeune, some of them on Camp Geiger. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is uh, that is definitely one thing that, that people stick around for is staying with their buddies, staying with their friends that you've gone to the field with a hundred times, that you've gone and had all these shared suffering experiences out, like <laughs> miserable ass cold weather or whatever it is, you know, you got rained on for three, four days straight together, you know, all this stuff, man, these shared experiences and they they transcend the military because when you get out one day, which everybody gets out one day, like you'll still have those experiences. And a lot of those guys, you'll stay, in, you'll still stay in touch with them. I'm sure you still stay in touch with a lot of the buddies that you made here, even if they left the unit. You know, um, what I, w- I was actually talking with Koenig about this a little bit earlier. Um, a lot of my friends that decided to get out, you know, dead set getting out, talked about it for years. Now that they've been out like five, six months, now they're trying to get back in. Yeah, they miss it. They miss it. Yeah. The, uh, they were asking like what the process would be, how easy it would be, how hard it'd be. Yeah. And a lot of them are getting told it's almost impossible. I, which is strange considering like the recruitment problem. You'd think they'd be like fighting for people to mm-hmm. come back. You know what I'm saying? Um, I'm sure that there's going to be some conversations being had by people with like stars on their collar and figuring that piece out. I would hope. Uh, because like, especially if somebody wants to be here and you know, they've already gotten training and you know, they already have experiences. You should want those people here. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so my fingers will be crossed for your buddies. Hopefully they'll be able to figure a way to get back in. I have friends that got out and, and joined back up after the fact as well. Uh, a couple friends of mine that I served with out in Hawaii. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, what is, um. What's really like, I kind of want to get a a feel for like what life is for you guys on a day-to-day basis as an 0311 rifleman. Like, cause like a lot of people don't know, like they think, oh, well, grunts just sit in the the barracks and play video games all day. Well, that's not necessarily what they always do. They may be like, hey, we're waiting for word. And so, yeah, I'm going to hop on the Xbox and kill some time while waiting for my platoon commander or platoon starting to tell me what we're doing next, you know? But what do you guys do during the day if it's not like, you know, in the field. So just like our day-to-day lives, um, Monday to Friday, it's like a nine to five job. Okay. Uh, we'll wake up, we'll wake up zero five, zero five thirty, go out PT for an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, and then shower, change over, grab chow. And a lot of times early in the mornings, especially in the winter months, was a little colder. We're waiting for things to warm up. Yeah. Uh, we'll kick, we'll kick classes in, in one of the lounges with, uh, with the platoons or just your squad. Uh, Knowledge is super important. Kind of mentioned it earlier that we're, we're a jack of all trades. So yeah. yes, we have missions we're training up for or for the field that we're like, whatever task we have coming on next, um, we'll, we'll hit that, but it's always good to back train as well so guys don't doubt of dumb things. Yeah. Um, you guys take fitness pretty seriously, an hour and a half? A- absolutely. I think um, fitness has definitely been getting pushed a lot more recently, like health and wellness and stuff. It, uh, yes. Um, so there, we have we have now like athletic trainers uh, oh. that are a part of the the, the battalion, and nice. um, we get to, we get to have conversations with them. So we try to learn and take as much as we can from that. And yeah. and uh, the CrossFit world is becoming a big thing in in uh, like that that style of training. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we call it uh, like hit training. Well, it's more like. Um, Functionality training, okay. Like, functional so like, fitness, functional fitness. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's what we try to focus towards. So like okay. a lot of a lot of our um, a lot of my workouts that I run with my squad are more or less boots and utes because we don't ever do anything in work and uh, like PT gear. Yeah. So we'll 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 go running down PT road in boots and utes and uh, flax or 
Kazavak runs, stuff yeah. like that. So, like, typically the morning PT, it's a little, it can be a little mental break off, but that's what the junior guys need. Yeah. And, uh, and then in the afternoon, it's it's on their own time to go PT and continue their physical fitness. But my sure. job is to make sure they can keep up with standards. Yeah. Um. So after PT, it's like a shower changeover period. It's a little grace period in the morning. Go get chow. Yeah. Um, and then we'll have formation. Um. Once we get accountability of all the guys at formation, we'll like I said, kick kick a class. It's like a company level formation, or yes. Okay. Usually around zero eight or something. Yes. Uh, we have ours at zero eight thirty. Okay. Um. Not bad. And then um, it just gives us enough time in the morning to do what we got to do and and, sure. and be ready for the day. Yeah. So and then typically after like kicking classes all morning, uh, we'll, we'll break for chow, and then we'll we'll conduct like physical training in the afternoon. Not not like a PT, but like uh, job standard training, like like body rushing or or T triple C or whatever yeah. whatever we have coming on. Or typically what we taught in the morning class, we will crack app it in the afternoon okay yeah that makes sense so like if you're teaching a class on land nav in the morning then you're like maybe executing dead reckoning that afternoon or something yeah, absolutely yeah um, a okay. lot, lot of things to do with patrolling loading pbs uh oh loading pbs is a big one yeah that's it's, a tough skill people don't realize how did how complicated it is to control it's like herding cats into a freaking everybody mako gate you know what i mean like everybody thinks it's easy because it can load it in the in the open field and then as soon as you put three trees in the way it goes to hell oh my god so. yeah it's amazing what trees can do to make it more difficult to make a triangle <laughs> you know yeah especially yeah, the, the gizbra the gizbra. that's what everybody tells me because it's like a swamp yep, yep. Yeah. um so i mean like i said nine to five and then like you said uh like if we're getting word or waiting for word to get passed Guys might hop on their Xbox, but we 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 really try to stay away from that in sure. our, in Bravo Company. It's um, we try to be, we try to time management as best as we can, like being proactive, and being stuff. proactive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even though we might not have something on the agenda, and all the higher ups are in a company sync, we're we're trying to still uh, maintain being productive. Sure. You know, everything in, in RCO's words, everything is prep for combat. Yeah. So yeah. Well, your safe. CEO has a your CEO's got a lot of passion in his yeah. heart for this absolutely. profession. Um one of the best. Yeah. Absolutely. I've never met him before, but I've i I've you know I've had a couple conversations with him. He seems like, you know, he he's like everyone here is my, are my children. Mm -hmm. I care about them. I want them to succeed in life, you know? So absolutely. Um so honestly Monday to Friday uh, that's what that's what it looks like back here in garrison in, in garrison yeah, yeah um field ops are a totally different animal yeah what's um, a field what's a field op like with you guys jeez if um, you're a bravo company you go to the field as you know yeah a lot of we do a lot of uh pecs or patrolling exercises okay. so um we'll, we'll go out there um half of the company will play op four okay. the other half will be uh you know just the the good guys and then yeah <laughs> well uh to we'll give people an like just a quick perspective do you guys, do you guys take first off? Do you take seven tons out there? or You get you like air inserted. Uh, seven tons. Okay, so you take seven tons. You got your main pack on, which is probably how much do you think that weighs? Uh, a typical, yeah, a typical pack weighs about fifty five, sixty pounds, and then um, and that's with chow and water. That's with chow and water, and then uh, gear to survive for a week, and then you have other mission essential equipment in there too, like radios. So sure. So everybody carries all that stuff out. And then while you've got your main pack on and your kit and your TO weapon and any cruiser of weapons you have and your radios, then you start making a movement into the tree line with that, trying to find a PB. So a patrol base. So typically yeah. we'll uh, we'll get inserted by seven tons, hop off the seven tons. And then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll just kick a movement uh, yeah. through the tree line. Typically two. Well, two click, two clicks to start, two three clicks. We'll get like uh, we'll get situated, start uh, pushing out patrols, and then uh, yeah, we'll we'll go war game each other in the woods. Yeah, so. well, that's the best way to get better at it from practicing, which mm -hmm. it sucks sometimes because it is not like easy on your body. But that's the only way to get good at doing patrol faxes. I will patrol bases. I will say, um, best job I ever had. But <laughs> hey, I pre I appreciate that passion from for dude. The the thing is is like you need people that love what they do doing this job because you're gonna be passing on that you're passing on that knowledge to the next generation and then they're gonna then be the they will then be responsible to pass it on to the next guys after them. You so know? we uh 
Corporal Strait and I were actually talking about this earlier. It's it's real tough to to find that passion or pass on that passion. Yeah. Um, it's one of those things that like when you get junior Marines coming to the fleet, they see how hard we train at first, and you kind of got to get over that hill, get over that hump. Yeah. Um, because it sucks. Yeah. It, embrace the suck. It's it's tough being so. in the in the infantry. Yeah. This job it's is not easy. This job isn't easy. Yo. Yeah. Everybody else gets driven around or flown around, and we got our Lamborghinis. Yeah. So, <laughs> That's um, it, man. So it's one of those things. Once you just start embracing it and and bonding with the guys to the left and right of you yeah. about how bad it sucks, you you start enjoying it. The time in the field flies by. Yeah. Um, the missions or the field ops you're doing. Uh, seem practical and uh, like getting an understanding of how everything works and why we're doing it. Yeah. Um, once you once you get an understanding of that, that's when people start building the passion for the job. Yeah. That's what it, that's that's what that comes down to. Yeah. Which probably just takes a little bit of time and experience. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um. Just just like anything, anything. The the sure. civilian world's not any different. Yeah. So um, once once you build that passion though, you get guys who 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 can't wait to get back to the field, who drive morning PTs, who come up in the morning and they kick the class instead of senior leadership kicking a class they will pre like build a presentation and kick information yeah so um like once you get that cohesion in the squad it it time flies by yeah that's that's for sure time will definitely fly by the busy especially when you're busy that's for sure so here's my next thing what 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 are your billets and what do you guys do so I'm with uh, Bravo Company or Beowulf, first platoon. I'm the second squad leader. Okay. Um, my job is to be an asset to my platoon commander and then the company commander and uh, control the guys under me. So how like, big is your squad? I have I have a squad of like nine guys at the moment. Okay. Um, and hopefully a TO will get a little more filled out, but we make do with what we have. So we get we get tasking from sir and we go complete. You know, uh, commander's intent. Go and execute. Yep. How about you? Uh, so I'm with uh, Weapons Platoon. I'm the third squad leader for Moz. Okay. Um, Which makes sense that so they would keep yeah. you there. Uh, <laughs> I was hoping when I re-enlisted to come to the line and be in a line platoon, but yeah. no, they put me in a... They're like, you know how to blow stuff yeah. up. Let's put you with Moz. <laughs> so uh, I'm in charge of about three to four guys. Uh, I'm the A-slash, so if our section leader's out, I'll take over. Okay. Uh, him and I, we share the load pretty well. Yeah. Especially when we're both there, we'll, you know, just help each other and do the job of each other at the same time. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, and then my role is to just task out to the platoons, provide that anti-armor, uh, armor ID capability okay. down into the squad level. Yeah. Maws and the PV are the best because, you know, not many avenues of approach out there in the tree line. But w What is Maz for people that don't know what Maz means? Uh, so that is the Carl Gustav, the 84 millimeter recoilless rifle. Okay. Uh, it is uh, the replacement for the 153 small. Now, does that stand for medium an anti-armor weapon system? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anti-armor, anti-personnel weapon system. We have a few different options. We have airburst. HE, HEDP, stuff like yeah. that. You have thermobaric rounds. They yeah. actually did away with those ones. They did? So the small had Why? the thermobarics. I thought we had thermobaric for the for the Carl, too. No. As far as I've ever seen, no. That's too bad. Uh, maybe those the Army Those are has, dope rounds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we have a loom. Uh, like I said, the airburst, especially for trench yeah. uh, clearing. Very good asset. Yeah. Uh, overall, it is a better weapon system than the small, but I grew yeah. up with the small, and I love that thing. So I got a love hate relationship with the small. I've never used the small before, but all of my buddies who were who were assault men told me that it literally like I had one buddy who said that he was uh, he was an a gunner for an, uh, um, a small range, and he said that they shot like I think six rounds before he got off the line. He mm. said he stepped off the line and puked. Yeah. It's because got a lot of kick like, behind it. It just like makes your insides turn to mush. Mm. Yeah, just standing around it, like, and those things are the loudest by far. One of the loudest weapon systems I've ever been around. Got a lot of hearing damage from that thing, but I love yeah. that thing. Doing yeah. mal with it, not great. No, it loves to catch on every door frame in existence. Yeah, when you're just dragging it through houses, mm -hmm. you're not shooting it. Yeah. You're just dragging it around with you. Yeah, it's like have, getting tied to a wheelbarrow, basically. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but while well, that's cool that they got you in, in Maws, that makes that makes sense. I yeah. can understand why they'd put you there. Hopefully, you'll get. I'm sure you'll get some other experiences to be in other places, especially as you pick up rank and you get 
um, you know, especially once you get closer to staff, like they're gonna, you're gonna get experience in the line at some point. Uh, one of the new concepts we're trying to adopt now because of assault men going away, uh, our section, we're trying to more lean towards the assault men concept. Yeah. So we've started implementing and training with uh, EOD more, getting actual demo ranges and stuff like that. So assault men may be gone, but we're trying to like continue that legacy and continue that asset. Yeah. O311s we- can cross train and learn everything that assault men did anyway. Yeah. So the I think that was another reason why they put me where they did. Yeah. Uh, I'm able to uh, give that SME perspective. Yeah. When it comes to demolitions, breaching stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, we've started focusing on that more as a section. So less so just solely ID and anti armor. Yeah. But actually breaching and uh, everything that came under the umbrella of an assault man. Well, that, that experience is invaluable. Mm. You know, like you you having that experience, that hands-on experience and that that prior experience of, of dealing with not only demolitions, but armor identification and all these other things of that nature, like that's going to be invaluable for all these young 11s who literally get almost zero or next to zero exposure to that yeah. while they're going through ITB because that's not what you know, going through the O three eleven pipelines about. So um having that ability to cross train them. And that that was kind of what a lot of my peers and I were thinking. They're like, hey, when uh, they get rid of assault men, like how are they gonna who's gonna do the demo? Are they just gonna attach engineers and the engineers are gonna be the only ones doing it? Or are they gonna cross train the elevens to do it? Makes more sense to cross train the elevens. You got a whole shit ton of elevens. So why not cross train them mm-hmm. so that they can do the same job that the engineers could do. You could still attach engineers for like specialized missions obviously that that's totally cool but everybody knowing how to do everybody else's job super super good idea because then you've got redundancy which you want because if somebody go, gets taken out this guy can do their job hmm. then yeah. having the ability to with understanding someone's job be able be able to better employ them yeah because you have that fundamental understanding of their job not just yeah. your own yeah, it's huge, man. That's awesome. I'm glad that I'm glad to hear that they're they're doing that stuff. I'm I'm so far removed from being the infantry because I haven't done grunt stuff since I was like, like real grunt stuff since I was uh, in Hawaii um, in 2019. That's when I left the infantry pretty much. So uh, obviously, things change very rapidly in the Marine Corps. Like when things change, it changes very quickly. And I haven't been in the infantry since for, for four years now. So. Um, it's interesting to see like all the changes that are coming down the pipeline and the improvements Mm -hmm. and like some of the things that they're doing to adjust and adapt to the new technology that's coming out based on what we're seeing on the news, based on what we're seeing with the Russia Ukraine conflict, based on what we're seeing with the Israel Hamas conflict, like all this stuff, there's so much stuff that changes all the time when it comes to warfare and, and, uh, tactics and everything. And, like being able to see all this stuff play out without having to be there is just as good for us intelligence gathering wise mm-hmm. as being there because we can learn hard lessons from other people without having to learn them ourselves, you know? So and then we can implement them ourselves. Like a good football reel. Yeah, exactly. Watch it's back. like watching, watching replays, you know, like how, oh, how did they do this? You know, okay, well, they did it like that. Well, okay, well maybe we should like prepare for this contingency to counter that thing. Or whatever that is, you know. We've been uh, using a lot of footage from the Russian-Ukrainian conflict yeah. to better understand the mall because, yes, it's been fielded by you know, SF for the past, you know, who knows how long. Very long time. But a lot of the mall for us is unknown. So getting to see the Ukrainians actually using it, say, shooting it from indoors, something we're always told you can never, ever do. Yeah. And they're just doing it, you know, three, four shots at a time. Yeah. It's showing us what we can better train for yeah and that's what we've been trying to uh kind of weave into our training is yes we train under great circumstances here for the most part you know yeah. safety is paramount yeah but trying to slowly take off those safeties to a degree at least in you know tdgs stuff like that actually yeah. training the way we fight yeah and that's been i'm hoping a life saving you know, ability of ours. I think it will be. I think it's going to pay off in the long run, especially with a lot of the other types of training that you guys are bringing out and and adapting with and instituting. Um, I think, I think nowadays, the the line companies and just the infantry in general are getting better quality training, and they have more 
at their fingertips than we did mm -hmm. um, in in years past. Um, I mean, you guys have better equipment, you have better technology. You guys all have PVS thirty ones. Yes, we had PVS fourteens. We were doing the whole like bang in your PVS fourteen because <laughs> it's it's going out every five seconds. Like you guys got the high cut ops core Mitch helmets. You got like everybody's got like you know either ops core amps or Peltors or something that they're talking through like. We're actually lacking on some of like the Peltor stuff. Are you? Uh, yeah. So I'm. I'm well, we need to get some of that for you. That's what we need to do. We would. We would love it. I know a lot of those Peltors go towards guys who shoot the mall, the malls, and, yeah. and and running like demo. Yeah. But uh, it's basically chain of command and radio operators who have it. Squad leaders were were kind of figuring it out. I'm not yeah. sure what's going to come of that. Come uh, time to actually step off. Uh, so. They ought to get you guys all ops core amps because you can hear everything. You can hear somebody talking like you're talking through a podcast mic, but anything over a certain decibel is canceled out. Best best I, best ear pro I've ever used in my life. The, the ops core amps are, are really good. Peltor is kind of the standard right now for, yeah. for whatever, for, for the price cost. Yeah, for the price cost, they're more reason, they're so, definitely much more reasonably cost for sure. So Peltors, you still have to, you should still double up your ear pro because they're not the end all be all. Yeah. But, um, they're they're great for comms communication and yeah. just being able to hear your other hear a team leader or a squad leader over machine gun fire. Like just running a normal range and trying to maneuver around a range is extremely difficult without any amplified ear pro. Yeah. Um you would think it's kinda like kind of common sense that hey if, if we if we can get a hearing advantage we should do it yes but it i don't know why but it's kind of put on the back burner yeah um well you guys all have suppressors on your weapons too right we do have suppressors yes but it's not that's not the end all be all and 240s don't have suppressors so i shot a 240 with a suppressor on it this past week uh, and I, I i'm 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 gonna do everything i can to try to convince somebody that they need to get that to you guys what what can was on the 240 it was like this long do you know that? It was probably like this thick. I can't remember the name of the company that makes them, but like they're trying to get in touch with the Marine Corps to get them suppress suppressors for 240s. Cause imagine if you could have suppressed automatic weapons. That like, would be or like uh, suppressed belt fed weapons. Mm -hmm. Like that's an advantage. Uh, that's an suppressed, advantage. A suppressed open bolt system. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the only thing you might run into um would be overgassing the bolt, but a, an adjustable gas block like the 240 has should be able to mitigate that no problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway, yeah, but but your pro and and being able to communicate while this like machine guns going off, huge deal. So thirty huge deal. Thirty ones were such an upgrade from the fourteens because when when uh, I went through ITV and hit the fleet, we had fourteens to begin with. And, yeah, uh, we got thirty ones last October. Got um, it was uh just over a year ago now, and it, they came with a little thermal clip on device called an Ecotti. Okay. Um, that is a game changer while being on patrols. You can see. Any thermal signature in the tree line. Um, that is sick. It's 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 wild. I I've picked up a thermal si signature already over 200 meters away. And these are uh, these are made by Elbit Systems, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah, that's sick, man. They are doing a good job because I've I've looked through them before. I had a buddy that had a pair when I was on a deployment. I was able to look through them and see what they look like, and it's like, dude, what an advantage! White phosphor is a game changer. Like it's like. Normally, people used to be like, "Man, I don't want. I'm just not. Gonna, I I see better without my your my I my uh, my PBS 14. I'd rather just flip it up and just use my night my natural night vision. Well, especially in the tree line when no natural illumination was coming through whatsoever. Yeah, it was just pitch black. Yeah. So yeah, but these things just like man, you flip them down, it's like everything becomes crystal clear. Mm -hmm. You can almost see the future. You can see so good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like. High, uh, like a, such a good investment, man. Such a good investment. So just about just about everybody on the line now has um, 31s, uh, an M27, yeah. suppressors, uh, the new SCO is being pushed. For the SCO, support. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now for like for weapons, uh, whether it be guns or malls, a lot of them are still rocking M4s and RCOs. Sure. But the average 11 on the line company is running, um, Running an M27. Yeah, M27 IAR, which is made by... Um, HK. HK, mm -hmm. yeah. Same which IAR stands for the Infantry Automatic Rifle, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they were just starting to come out when I... Well, I think they were just starting to come out in 2016. 
that's when I first started seeing them. I was like, what the hell is that thing? Like, it was, it was like this gigantic boomstick. You know what I'm saying? We call it our muskets. Yeah, they're like a musket. It's like an M16 because they're freaking long, but they have the, fl- the free floating barrel. So they're, they've got a smaller minute of angle. There. You know, they can fire on fully automatic, you know, and if everybody had a fully automatic weapon, it's like kind of a game changer. You know what I mean? So uh, there, there are two MOA guns, um, 16 and a half inches long without the suppressor, and then you add a seven-inch suppressor on the end. <laughs> oh, like over 20 inches long? Uh, yeah, imagine imagine doing mount with a musket. I mean, that's what, <laughs> that's what we do. That's bananas. They ought to get you guys like some shorty 300 blackouts for, for, go- for doing that. Preach it. Preach it. <laughs> that's oh, awesome, man. man. So um, we make do with what we have, and a lot of dudes – I'm blessed to be in this battalion because here in here in one eight, uh, we have the Warfighting Society meeting, which really was a game changer when it came to our SOPs and gear SOPs. Yeah. Um I'm I'm allowed to run my own butt stock on the M twenty seven. I'm That's allowed cool. to I'm allowed to change my gear as long as I'm running the Marine Corps issued plates, my plate carry can be can be changed changed and uh made more effective no kidding so it's it's one of those things that like because that meeting came about and we were able to change things within our uh battalion here it has made our job way better and more lethal more better capability so i would push any other but anybody else in other units like you can do the same thing go to your chain of command yeah get a war fighting society meeting like going and and push SOPs and new standards to your hire. That's what it should be all about. Like making you guys more lethal. Like if if the gear makes you more effective as a warfighter, why aren't we using it? Mm-hmm. You know, that that used to be a problem that you'd run into where they have like these standard gear SOPs that hey, everyone will wear their war belt. They will have two canteen pouches on it with canteens in it. They will have this many magazines on it, all that stuff. It's like no, 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 no. Let's not we're, let's not do that stuff. Let's let's figure out a way. Hey, every individual person is going to have different skill sets and different levels of per, like perfe- like um, proficiency with different things. They may be left-handed. They may be right-handed. They may be riding in vehicles more often. They may not be riding in vehicles more often. They may be a gunner. They may not be a gunner. Like they should set their kit up in a way that's going to make them more lethal. So, um, with that, like. We have like grenadiers. Grenadiers are rocking three twenties. That is their primary weapon system. I dig it. So with that being said, they might not carry as many magazines as a normal rifleman because right. they need room for their forty mic mic. Yes. Um hundred percent. And then a squad leader might not carry as many mags on their person because they're carrying maps, compass, sure. a dagger, yeah, and, and just other equipment. They're controlling stuff. They don't yeah. necessarily need to be pulling the trigger. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's that's and it's it's come a long way. Yeah, that's good to hear, man. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Like, it sounds to me like you know, we have come very far as far as just like the evolution of the 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 I don't want to say basic warfighter, but it's like O three eleven is like the rifleman of the Marine Corps. Like it's like the door kicker of the Marine Corps. The O three eleven. We've come very far. Um, you know, some of the some of the smartest guys I've met were were O three elevens. You know, I'm not if I'm being hundred percent honest. Um, so I, I'm glad to hear that. You know, things are things are going well. You guys are getting better gear. You're getting better training. You're getting uh, a lot of support from your command to make sure you're able to set up your kits to be more lethal. Um, you guys are having a lot more different technology available to you that makes you more effective as a warfighter. Like all that stuff is really cool, man. Um, but Look, I appreciate you guys taking the time to come talk to me for 35 minutes here. Um, I know this is Saturday, so it's like libo. So you're taking your own personal libo time. I want you guys to understand how important liberty is for the Marine Corps. Like, especially for grunts, we are libo. We are libo hounds. So um, the fact that you guys took the time out of your day to come chill with me and like sh- <laughs> shit about, you know, the infantry and like what life is like being an 0311, that means a lot. It means a lot to me. And I know it's going to mean a lot to other people as well that are in the profession or anyone that's like considering the profession. Um, I think this is huge. So, uh, again, I appreciate you guys taking the time to come out here and, uh, you know, best of luck in all your endeavors. And I look forward to seeing um, everything that comes about from your battalion. I know everybody's the hype is the hype is real. One eight is home. One eight is home. There we go. All right. Appreciate it.